us for the day, and we'll get the day going. So thanks, Paul, coming. Thanks for bearing with the weather and showing up. Uh, we appreciate that. So just run through the agenda here. Um, we have a couple uh, introduction stuff. We have Dr. Blake and talk to you guys. Get in. We can give you a quick intro to all the sound for those of you who don't know. Um, as much or haven't really used it that much. Uh, and then we're going to move you over to our technical skills lab. Uh, we'll have three stations in the morning. Uh, we'll come back here for lunch uh, and the first part of our competition all request will be during lunch. Uh, and then we'll end the day back at the skills center. So that's kind of the rough idea. Um, we'll have signs over there as well. Uh, you guys the rest of the day. Um, you all got a name tag like this. Uh, this right here in the middle is your the order of the stations. It's your schedule. Um, I'll be the first, the first going throughout the day. Uh, so keep your name tag. Those are the stations you're going to. Uh, there was some confusion with the numbers. Cardiac 2 and Cardiac 1 are the same. The difference is we're trying to put you guys up to have more hands on time. So make sure you go to the cardiac two, not one. Uh, it's the same material. Just want to make sure there's uh, no overcrowded stations. Um, and then the bottom is on uh, your team name and what room you'll be in for lunch uh, or the ultra quest teams. Uh, 160 is this room. Uh, the room right next door is 112, so they're both in the same building. We'll probably get to you all in here because our numbers have been removed for weather. So we'll let you know for sure. Okay. We'll have uh, these up, uh, our conversation maps throughout the hallways uh, and the rooms when we go to the scanning sessions. Uh, the thing is a little weird, but this is the hallway. Uh, it's not in the big room. Uh, we'll have four stations there. And this right here is the ultrasound room. It's a different room. We'll have signs for all of this, and these will be up there, but just giving you an idea. Uh, this is the main room here. So we'll have one room, most of the stations, the hallway, and then a second smaller room, the ultrasound room. There'll be signs that are to guide you. We'll have these up for every uh, station shift change as well. Uh, but just to give you an idea of what's your next station. Uh, afterwards, we have a reception, a uh, happy hour at Sauber Brewing Company. Uh, it's one of my favorite places in Columbus. It's right up the street. Uh, so 5, 3 to 8, uh, happy hour, food, drinks. Uh, please come join us there. Uh, it's time for the roast of beer, and you guys can hang out. And just a thank you. Thank you to Ohio State, uh, the Medical Center, the Emergency Department, and College of Medicine for helping us put this on. Uh, Dr. Boehner and Dr. Bolger are our faculty advisors in the countless hours in this with us. Uh, Zach and General and Tom Curry. Staff and Jenny Edwards and a bunch of other MLMs and twos, threes, and fours helped us uh, coordinate this entire event. Uh, we have residents, Bridges Mess, and IM residents as well, who are proctoring them with them on the stations. Uh, we have a launch of Sir Law and Offset program at OSU. Uh, so we have a bunch of fourth semester students who are going to proctor you guys today, too. Uh, we have a model pool where we train medical students uh, to become also models of uh, course you can have live. Uh, People to want a scan on. Uh, they're all on during the time as well. We have an amazing guest speaker, Dr. Flankenship. Uh, we'll introduce him in a little bit. Uh, so he came down for this. Uh, we also have a special guest, uh, Dr. Bruce Lewis and uh, Bob Jones. I think Bob Jones is able to come up with the weather. But uh, definitely, uh, come around and talk to them. They have a lot of expertise in skill. Uh, finally, we have seven amazing vendors who donated money and machines for this day. Uh, we, have a, we have 39 machines um, donated from all seven of these people. Uh, so they're vendors, uh, salespeople are here, they're, uh, they have sonographers who are here as well. Uh, they'll be up by the uh, machines, so please thank them. Uh, they give us a lot of help for these events. Uh, also, apparently it also sounds huge on the Twitter world. I did not know this. Uh, <laughs> But definitely post pictures from today. Um, we'll see also all the quest for the competition all the best for the day. Without further ado, Dr. Boehner is our faculty advisor to say a few words as well. We give it up to Dr. Boehner, future Dr. Boehner. <laughs> I'm Dave Bader, I'm from the University of Madison. I had a vision a long time ago that medical students could learn how to do ultrasound. So we have uh, been putting ultrasound in the medical printer here at Ohio State. 
all the way from Met 1, 2, 3, and 4. Michael Wolf and most of the honor students are part of the fourth year elective, which is kind of a capstone for all the sound program, where they have to get longitudinal lectures over a year's period of time, they have hands on stations, they do journal clubs, and they all have to do a project. This is Michael's project, and he's done a fantastic job. When he was a first year student, he went out to California, and Chris Fox, a friend of mine, started. Um, he has the same kind of zeal for it, also sound like it. He worked with some medical students, put on something called Ultra Fest. And what he did was he wanted to get um, vendors and students together so that they could learn about ultrasound. And not everybody had the same opportunity of a medical school. Michael came back and said, We should do that here. He's been planning this. We tried to put the operation of vendors. Again, we have some site, we have line break, putting on their GP, to sheep, uh, Siemens. Um, and then we also have one of the world's best virtual um, way to demonstrate the ultrasound pathology, Son of Sin, which is going to be on a few stations, going to be highlighted in all the class. Craig Bolger is one of my um, close colleagues in the Lewis Medicine, and together we have put on events in the every winter called the Ultrasound Olympics. We had to change that name because that was copyrighted. So we had called the Ultrasound Challenge. And the purpose was to see if there was a competition with students who could compete. We set us all in the basement of this facility about five years ago. Um, and then grew to last year where we had multiple schools come and compete. We we'll wrote that up in the Journal of Ultrasound. We tried to do is combine that with our this ultra fast, so we came up with ultra quest. So we're looking forward to the day, which is going to be uh, a lot of fun. There's going to be a lot of education. There's a lot of um, knowledgeable people with equipment and technology. And then after we learn, at lunchtime we're going to have a Jeopardy session, which is uh, a round one of ultra quest, and we have the round two after ultra fest is done, which is going to be a scanning challenge. And then finally, we're going to get down to a couple of teams and we're going to have a scan off using the, the Sonos device. devices. So we're really looking forward to the day. Um, we have a couple of guests. Dr. Risa Lewis is a, uh, uh, a colleague. She's an ultrasound producer. She's the uh, ultrasound chair of the ASAP section in emergency medicine, very powerful emergency physicians. Path forward for all reasons now taking charge of that section. She's from Denver, she's come to join us. She's um, started an ultrasound industry group out in Colorado and wants to see how to put on a ultra fest. Our goal eventually is that these kind of events could have the regional competitions to go up to national meetings where there could be a, a competition at a national meeting, where there's an organization called the Society of Ultrasound and Medical Education. They have a World Congress each year. This past year was in Portland. They had a, an ultrasound world cup, and we had a competition out there. But as this starts to grow, more and more people do this. We're hoping that these kinds of events can then lead to regional competitions that can be a, a national uh, uh, competition with, with students um, just trying to promote ultrasound. So we're really trying to celebrate ultrasound today. We're really glad you're here. Um, we have a great day ahead to do this. We have a lot to put an agenda together and we see what we can fluid and flexible as, as things may change. I want to just introduce uh, a good friend of mine, Dr. Bob Blankenship, who I've known for probably a decade now. He is uh, an emergency physician. He's a former military. He's um, traveled across the world and taught so many people how to use ultrasound. Uh, one of my favorite stories about Bob is he was uh, teaching, he wanted to prove uh, that he could teach lung ultrasound and taught it to a bunch of cooks on a, on a military ship. He said, if you teach a cook, you need to follow a recipe. So, he put the uh, Mount Ultrasound into a resident to communicate that. Rob's a fantastic speaker. He's going to share with us some of his experience in the ultrasound in the military, how it's being used, ultrasound in austere environments. So let's welcome Dr. Bob Blank to share here. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, there's nothing like coming in from the cold to a warm environment, put a little food in your belly, and then let you listen to somebody prone on for about 40 minutes. But <laughs> this morning, I'd like to do really three things with you. The first thing is just sit back, relax, and for the first 20 minutes, for the first time in probably years, not to take any notes. You can just kind of experience what I went through. And then for the next 20 minutes, 
I'm going to show you what we're able to do with ultrasound and teach you guys some of the lessons that I learned, albeit the hard way, about the true impact of ultrasound. And then the last 20 minutes, when you're really ready to go to sleep, I'm going to challenge you. And those who set up front, sorry for your luck. <laughs> Every environment. I, I trained in a very busy community emergency medicine residency here in Iraq. I've been in a level one trauma center. I've been in big regional medical centers. And I'm currently the chairman of medicine in one of my hospitals in Indianapolis. And I also staff five different EDs uh, throughout town. I work with both kids and adults. So I've kind of practiced in every environment. But I've got to be honest with you, the austere environment really opened my eyes to why ultrasound is so useful. And I'm hopeful that this morning, by sharing a few things with you guys, that you really start to see why Dave is so passionate about ultrasound, why I am so passionate about ultrasound. Because it's not just in Iraq or Afghanistan or on a submarine base or on Air Force One where ultrasound is really important. It's important in your patients' lives today. Now, I'd love to tell you that I led a charmed life. And in fact, if you go back in uh, when I was at Florida, Texas, I was going to be the next program director. And I was pretty young for the position. I'm like, all right, well, you know, I've got a pretty good chance at this. My boss called me and said, I'd really like to meet with these part. I'm like, this is the day, right? He's going to tell me you've done such a great job. You're such a good guy. Your hair is amazing. We're going to give you this program director spot. Unfortunately, that's not what he had to say. He said, Rob, I'm really sorry. You're kind of young. I think next time around, you're going to be picked. But we do have a bonus for you, a paint on sabbatical in Iraq. So I'm like, sweet, my wife's going to be stoked. I told her when I left the house today, I'm going to get a new job. That was true. The job I got is not necessarily the one I was looking for. So when you work in the military, there's many different places you can go. You can go to the combat support hospital. They kind of play doctor. They have buildings where they take care of patients. It's not a whole lot different than your hospital. There's politics, there's lots of equipment, and there's lots of sick patients. But the Army also has a professional filler system. What that means is that you get assigned to a unit. So when bullets start flying, every unit has a physician. Well, I was assigned 4th Infantry Division, 166 Armour. So that's tanks. So I had 650 tankers under my command, you know, that I was responsible for. And so I'm like, you know, I met the old man and he said, you know what, Doc, we had an obstetrician before as our doctor. I'm pretty stoked to have an emergency physician. Right, 650 guys, I've got an obstetrician, not a lot of help. So, he said, we're excited to have you as an emergency physician. And I'm like, well, you should be. Well, that's what he said. <laughs> so we roll up to the jet. So we charter a jet and it's Iraq, because that's how we roll, thank you for your tax dollars. We go up to this American Airlines and I'm like, yeah, this is looking pretty nice. You know, they, they understand the value of an emergency physician. And then they go, Doc, here's your seat up in first class. And I'm like, yeah. You know, this is pretty good. They were like making cookies for us. And these were laid down seats. It was nice. It was really, really nice. And then we arrive in Kuwait and they take us to our quarters. And I'm thinking, well, I was in first class, pretty excited to see what kind of room they put me up for the night. It was pretty nice. Um, <laughs> you all laugh, this tent is nice. It was about 120 degrees because it was 3 a.m. It was the cool of the day. Um, and this tent has an uh, air conditioner, so it will drop the temperature at least 20 to 30 degrees. Now, you may say on a hot day, 135, it's 105 in the tent, that's hot, nay, nay. Go outside, that's hot. You come back in, it feels wonderful. Now, it does change. You get into the tent, you're freezing, you get under the blankets by morning, you're sweating, you walk outside for five minutes, you come back in, you feel good, you go back to sleep. This is my medical crew. Uh, these are, this is it. 650 guys. Um, let's see here. I am the, uh, the ugly dude there on your the left. The next guy over is my uh, PA. He had been out of school for a really long time. I think he graduated 30 days before we went down range. The next guy was a medical platoon <laughs> leader. He's kind of like the hospital administrator. That's why he has that funny look, because he has no clue what he's doing. And then the next guy over is an orthopedic PA. Great guy in the Kosovo. Really a good guy. And, and so we get to Kuwait. It literally is about 130, 135. It's, it's toasty. Um, and we start doing sick calls, see a lot of nosebleeds, really don't do anything. About six days later, we line up. 
Now, if you've ever done medicine in an austere environment, I don't know what you are envisioning, but this is it. Uh, these vehicles are uh, 113s and 1068s. That is my mobile care location, if you will. So when we're on the road, when we're on the road, this is where we take care of people. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been inside a tent can at about 130 degrees. It's hot. We sat inside these for about 12 hours one day because, you know, we weren't ready to go. It was nice. And then uh, we finally pushed them to Iraq. Um, I don't know what the road balls are, but evidently when there's 100 camels who have to cross the street, that takes priority over 250 tanks. So we stopped. Uh, I don't know what you guys see in downtown Columbus, uh, but this was new to me. Uh, we kind of watched these camels and like, this is pretty cool, you know, I think I could dig this. I mean, it's, it's not the hospital, but I think I can tolerate this. The other thing that was interesting as we went into Iraq is that there are all these kids lining the street. And they're waving, and they kept going like this, like I'm hungry, and like, oh my gosh, these kids are hungry, so we're throwing food out. Within a couple of days, like, no, no, keep your food, it tastes horrible, we eat sand, it's all good. <laughs> but, you know, we saw a lot of kids, when they would stop, they would come up and try to tell you, you know, they're sick, they really just wanted to hang out with us, which was kind of cool. And then we got to Detroit. And again, I started having visions of grandeur, right? I'm looking at this joint, and I'm saying, this isn't too bad, this is just the entryway. Right? This is, this is not when they had about six palaces on which a great compound, and I'm thinking, I just need one for my aid station. It's looking pretty good. Um, but unfortunately, that's not what I was assigned. This is just where the division was. Uh, we actually got assigned to Samara. Now, this is the guest quarters, uh, former uh, guest quarters for Saddam Hussein. And this was one of his garages that had its tile roof that just kind of kept some of the cars and stuff like that. So pretty nice, but not the town I took over. We took over the town of Samara, and that was my area of responsibility. Uh, some of the religious holidays, we had about 1.5 million uh, people in the town. You talk about a mass gathering event. That's, there were some interesting days when you have 1.5 million people, you have two PAs, an emergency physician, and about 20 medics. So this is Samara. Um, if things ever settle down, it's actually quite a beautiful city. This is the Al-Hadi Mosque. Um, it's, really, it's considered, I think it's one of the top five religious sites in the uh, Muslim faith. Absolutely beautiful from the outside. Um, you're not allowed inside the mosque with weapons, so I never saw it because you need to be armed. Um, unfortunately, after our unit left Samara about six months after that, um, there was actually an explosion there and demolished half the Golden Dome. Um, some other sites that we had that we were responsible for maintaining in Samara. Uh, this is a spiral minaret. This has been around for a couple thousand years. Absolutely an amazing structure. Uh, luckily, we were able to talk to some of the religious leaders to get special permission um, to go up on the, on the minaret and take a look around. And so, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to think this isn't too bad. I went out for the beach, you know, the honeymoon's on, everything's good. We also were in charge in Samara for making sure that the ancient ruins in the city did not get violated because of the violence in Iraq. So this is some of the uh, ancient ruins that we were responsible for. We quickly found out that the closer we were to this, the more mortars that went in it. So we actually positioned ourselves about two to three clicks away from it, just so that as people tried to mortar us, they wouldn't damage the ruins. So as you can see, kind of a beautiful city. You know, it's like, well, if I'm going to be a battalion surgeon, at least I've got a nice city. And it was really nice for about the first three to four weeks. After that, not so nice. This is uh, some of the things that we encountered. Uh, as if you guys are, are not aware, uh, evidently as a physician, you're also called to be a veterinarian in the military. Um, one of the general orders was, under no circumstances are you to adopt pets. <laughs> that lasted about three weeks until my commander said, Doc, the boys want a dog. I so strongly encourage against that. Uh, Doc, I'm telling you, we're getting a dog. <laughs> Yes, sir. So this is one of our puppies. I know that you have heard that there are no uh, chemical casualties in Iraq. That's not true. Um, I treated the first chemical casualty in Iraq, and that's him right there. He got into the fly paste, um, which has organophosphates in it. Luckily, in the military, what do we all carry on us? Two Pam and atropine. What's the problem? Those are adult doses. I don't do much veterinary medicine, but he's pretty small. So we shot the auto injectors into a urinalysis cup. 
and then drew up the appropriate dose, and then gave this dog a gazillion shots over the next two to three days. Dog survives, unfortunately. You've all seen a skin popper, right? What happens? Abscesses. So I drained about 30 abscesses on this dog over the course of the next week. He survives until the next water attack. That was the end of, the, the end of our puppy. <laughs> Sorry, for the girls in there, sorry. <laughs> sorry. The guys are like, next slide. <laughs> and then, as if it's At the end of it, I'm whooped. Well, this thing was on a piece of paper. And when I went to my mom, I found the paper. But he was gone. And I said, hey, did you guys get rid of the scorpion? No. Hey, did you throw away that scorpion? No. Don't worry, Doc, it's dead. Mm -hmm. he, this thing's so nice. He actually got in my uh, blanket. He was warming it up for me. So this, you can't really tell. This is actually like a really spider. It's like maybe as long as my mom. I actually saw scorpions, the body look this long, not including the tail. So um, I decided he was not sleeping in my bed for the night, and he succumbed to a close head injury. <laughs> <laughs> we also had some electrical injuries. Um, I know from this slide you can't really fathom why. Um, with the Iraqis, we bring in local Iraqis to kind of wire up our electricity and they give us uh, best quality. Um, so you can see here we've had a few fires. Um, and the other thing is the water heaters, the, the electricity, they didn't have like a special coil that went into the water to heat it. So about every three months, they would lose that protection. And as you know, when you turn on a shower, your hand is dry. But when you turn it off, your hand is wet. The electricity conducts much better than the wet. So about every three months, you hear a scream and then it's kind of a big boom where somebody got blown out of the shower. And that's how we do it time to change the water. So you know, we had typical you know, things like that. This is my aid station. Try not to be jealous. I know this is the Ohio State University. You probably don't have to get classes. But this is where I was a pair of guys. And this is also where 30 of us slept. 
So if you can't tell, it's kind of hard to see, but there's some boots in here because this was an elementary school and you know kids were kind of all this all the time. So this is basically, this was an elementary school that actually was kind of a, a military headquarters, if you will. They figured if they labeled it as a school, we wouldn't notice the tanks outside. Um, so after we uh, took care of that, um, we took this area over because it had concrete, which is really nice for people to the motors at you. And we kind of cleaned the joint up, but it didn't clean up too bad. And again, try not to be impressed. Um, we have these litters, they're kind of like your out of the events that cost $3,000. These only cost like $800, probably. Uh, we have our medical supply area. Uh, we have IV fluids. Check it out. We have a sharks container. That's pretty nice. And this picture will not come out of this lecture because this, <laughs> this are false art symmetry. That's the most sophisticated piece of equipment I have. That's it. This is where we took care of over 100, but you guys can call them level one traumas in Samara, right? So kind of interesting digs. Now I've talked about some of the more mundane stuff that we saw, but you know, obviously we're not Boy Scouts, right? And these guys are driving around tanks with big guns on them. So we saw a lot of different things. So this is uh, one of our um, water platoon officers. Uh, he's got a little concrete in his face here, a little concrete up here, basically an IED blast. Not too close parts of it, I think he's about 50 feet away. He's just got a couple stones, no big deal. Uh, these guys, it looks pretty nasty. I don't know how much you guys know about RPGs, but this is the tail tail mark that your vehicle's been struck with an IED. This is what a tail fin looks like. This is soft skin humpy. Fortunately, the guys were really close to the Humvee when they launched this, and the RPG almost went through the entire vehicle before it exploded. So even though this was a soft skin, um, and you can see some damage to the vehicle, most of the people actually fared pretty well uh, in, in this uh, issue. Um, for those of you guys who've never seen a tank, you might notice that something is missing, right? Big turret that locks the, the, the big uh, rounds down range. So even though, um, we were not fighting in any of the had tons of things. They did like to stack anti-tank uh, mines. So this thing ran over 10 stacked anti-tank mines and it blew the turret one football field away. Uh, we lost one of the soldiers and uh, three others greatly injured. Uh, this guy here had been in country about three weeks or so. Uh, an RPG went off while he was up on the tank and basically some shrapnel wounds to his uh, anterior and lateral shoulder. Uh, he actually did quite well. He was out of the country for about six months and he opened this up. Uh, obviously, you see a few gunshot wounds uh, when there's a lot of people around with guns. Uh, this is one of the enemy combatants who suffered gunshot wounds in the abdomen. So, you know, typical stuff that you would expect in the military environment. Uh, this guy was uh, sleepy when an RPG came through into his our quarters. Um, he had, I don't know, uh, I'm guessing maybe about 50 to 100 gold slots on really small part of seat. So this is kind of the typical fare for us, and this is our aid station. And as you can imagine, that presents some big challenges, right? I mean, think about, I don't know where you guys are, I know there's some first years here, second years, and there is life after biochemistry. For you third and fourth years, you may have had them in semester rotation or trauma service, this is probably, I'm, I'm spending a lot of that night in the trauma center, but I'm pretty sure this is not how you guys roll. Now we have automated blood pressure cuffs, right? I look at SMART and I say, you get blood pressure every five minutes, and say, yes sir, in five minutes, I have one. But that's how we took care of patients. And so I say those things to say, let's go through what I saw and let's think about it a little differently. Because when you think about foreign bodies and, and other things, how do we evaluate that in the United States, right? We have all this fancy equipment. We've got CT, we have X-ray, we have MRI. It's almost limitless what we have. This is us taking care of a few enemy combatants, you can tell, because they don't have uh, boots on. Okay? US soldiers wear boots, so we don't look like this. And you have very limited equipment to take care of. These guys weren't too bad. They got pulled up. They were minding their own business when an RPG shot at us from the same location they were at. Um, these guys weren't too bad, but you know, there's a lot of guys who came in. And the first lesson I'd like to teach you this morning is, when you carry a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You ever met an orthopedic surgeon, right? That patient can be coded, and what do they say? You go up, roll the board on you can take it to the OR. You go up, we get a pulse back, you go, we'll let you do that, right? These guys are kind of doctors, they don't wear a stethoscope for a reason, they don't want to be confused with an actual physician. So, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> 
because they're big and I don't want to fight. <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, when you carry a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I'm here to tell you today that you're going to play with the hammer that I love the best, Paul Shen. Because think back to those pictures that I showed you on the type of casualties I saw. And let's think about them a little bit more clearly. I don't know how many foreign bodies you've seen in your practice. But most of your patients come in and they're like, I stepped on a thorn and I have a hole in my foot right here. You probably know where the foreign body's at. When you drop a mortar, like a 120 mortar or even a 55 millimeter round, you can have a hole here, and that piece of strap can be in their hand, or it can be in their shoulder, or I've even seen guys with holes in their groin, and I find the strap on the apex of their lung because there's primary blast injuries, secondary blast injuries, tertiary blast injuries. You don't know where these things are. So here's this guy here, right? I saw probably 300 foreign bodies in a period of a year. Most of them are blast. You can push on them, and what are you supposed to say? Well, it hurts when I push there. Well, sure it does. You got shot. You had an RPG go off. But with ultrasound, you can look, and you can tell them exactly where the foreign body is. And you can see, this is a, this is a handful of money. You can see if it's in the actual joint, or if it's not in the joint. You can see if it's in the tendon or not. Because the deal is, when I evacuate you from my area of responsibility, I am not going to see you for another six months, and there's nobody who's going to come do your job. And you don't want Dr. Blankenship securing the compound at night, right? You want the guys who carry the weapons for a full time job. So we're able to use ultrasound to quickly identify foreign bodies. How about this kid? In the United States of America today, this kid comes in, we treat his pain pretty aggressively, right? We do conscious sedation before we wash this wound out. Now, this is a young soldier, and I can tell how, because he's not fat. Tankers are fat. They ride everywhere in the tanks, right? That's why I walk when you can ride. Right? How's the God? Why stay up when you can sit? Why stay up when you can lay down? Why stay awake when you can sleep, right? Well, evidently they read it too, because tankers, if they could drive from tank down the hall to use the bathroom, they would. They're fat. And the problem is, when you're getting shot at, and you sedate a 280 pound man, and they start walking the orders in, Guess who's got to drag this guy behind it away? Me. And I'm already heavy enough with all my gear on. I don't want to drag this guy behind it. I've got my own fat behind it. I need to get out of the area. So what we would do is we take ultrasound and we do an interscaling dirt block. And this guy would have absolutely no pain and we could completely ride away this one. We could completely wash this out and he'd feel great. We do nerve blocks for feet, nerve, you name it. If I could block it, I did. Because I could completely control the pain. I didn't have to deal with a sedated soldier on the battlefield, but we were literally still taking fire. And more importantly, I don't have to worry about this guy stopping breathing because I gave him too much medicine. And last but not least, do you think this guy's gonna have pain for one day or 30 days? He's probably gonna have pain for a long time. And the more nerve blocks we use, the less we have with narcotic addiction and abuse. How about this guy? He takes a round to his belt. I don't know where he got your training. But the first rule of emergency medicine is bad. Not bad. Pull into the abdomen? Bad. Okay. But where is it bad? Was he laying down when he got shot? Was he standing up when he got shot? Did his IBC, did his aorta, did his kidney, did his bladder? With ultrasound, two to three minutes, I can tell you if he has free fluid in his belly, if he has a pericardial fusion, if he has fluid around his belly, it literally takes you two minutes. How do you do it? You probably send him down to CT, right? Because that's how the radiologist puts her kids in power. <laughs> how about this guy? 50 holes in his chest. You ever been shot? It sucks. And I see those things, you're like, yeah, okay, tell me something I don't know. Here's what you don't know. What are we supposed to look for in a pneumothorax? Tachycardia. I got news for you. You get shot, your pulse goes up. You might have to change your bridges, too. It's not a good time. Does your chest hurt? Yeah, I think it does. I got 50 holes in my chest. Right? You having a hard time breathing? Yes, it hurts. And, then, and before we acquire it, which is a military term for stole, those pulse oximeters from the combat support hospital, we had no pulse ox, so you can't rely on that. With ultrasound, I could tell you if this guy had a pneumothorax or not. Now, this is a pneumothorax, but this guy actually did not have a pneumothorax. 
we are able to not place chest tubes in this patient, which is a big deal because you guys call medical supply and are upset because you don't have a drug culture in the room. I have that to my fly 300 sometimes miles to bring in my gear and I wrap it from my mouth. So we really need to know who's sick and who's not sick. How about this guy? You're probably saying, wow, I knew these military guys from Mars, but this guy has an open head injury and they've got him with handcuffs on. Not true. He was buying his own business when two dudes rolled up and shot an RPG off. And they were so excited they didn't wait for the chamber to pull and they shot another one off. But unfortunately, if you don't let them pull, the round goes off in the device. And so this is actually the two dudes uh, going up is. But with ultrasound, I don't have an NCT, but I can look for increased intracranial pressure. How about this guy? He's one of my best medics. He got a kidney stone one day. How do you tell that in the field? Ultrasound. <coughs> How do you keep from hitting it when it's 100 and some degrees? Evidently, you put an IV in when you're carrying litters all day. So this guy put his own IV in and carried about 80 litters one day. He said, Doc, I must have done well. I didn't get another kidney stone. I said, Well, that's fine. If you're the guy that was still kept here, because I can tell you if you're instructed or not. Focus on <laughs> this guy was on the checkpoint and he got ran over by a car or got rolled over the car. So here's his right frontal bone. Is he going to get any hematoma? Here's his left. Here's a little tip, one side always looks like the other. Here's another tip in old shine. If you're born with it, it's round. So when you see right angles, you've got broken bones. This guy had a frontal skull fracture, which is yes, 15, no. He said he had no headache, he had no nausea, no vomiting. But I can make a decision at 3 o'clock in the morning that this guy needs a bird and he needs an hour because he has a skull fracture and my aid station is not the best place for him. How about rib fractures? It's great. Not only can we tell if you have a new I can tell you if you broke your rib. And I can tell you when your callus has begun to form, so it's ready to put your body on the back on and go back to work. We don't have enough time today to go over the hundreds of cases that I use with ultrasound. But I hope you quickly see that why I say when you carry a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Because this ultrasound machine is all I've got. And so when I went over to Iraq, I'm like, all right, yeah, we'll do a fast exam. I mean, I can do that, whatever. But I didn't really believe. I wasn't drinking the pool. But when it's all you have and it's literally someone will die in front of you if you don't make the right decision, and to be blunt, someone will die if you make the wrong decision evacuating the patient, we lost an entire medevac crew flying a guy out one day. So you really need to know when you're going to bring that bird down because they can get shot out of the air. They can have an air accident coming in. They could get blown up on the LT. One of the generals came to visit Mike, sir. I wouldn't need your helicopter there. I oh, it's totally fine. Halfway through the general's briefing, boom. Yes, sir. I don't know how much helicopter costs. They're not cheap. Thank you very much for your tax dollars. They blew it up. So you really need to know when your patients are sick. So I'd like to go into a few rules and then we'll wrap up with a challenge. The first thing I learned about ultrasound in Iraq is that. You know what? Ultrasound is not a spectator sport. You know, I played the lip service when I was an emergency physician before I went, but I truly fell in love. And I don't know if you guys remember December 2013 is when the cotton stopped and say, we were doing a big mission. And it was my job to stand up the mobile operating pre screening area for the mission for the capture of this So they're like, all right, Doc, here's your thing. I'm going around and there's a surgical team in town for this mission. And I see an ultrasound machine. I'm like, hey, where'd you get that? Oh, you can't touch that. That's the surgeon. You can't touch that. He doesn't let anybody touch it. You know, sorry. So I go find a surgeon. I go, hey, I saw you have an ultrasound machine. I really like to use it. He goes, dude, you show me how to turn that thing on. It's yours. I've been trying this thing for six months. I have no idea how to use it. After the mission, I did 15 ultrasounds. He's like, looks like you can use it. I thought you saw my hand and see how good it's going to be. But you all laughed, but how many people in the hospital use ultrasound today? Do all your attendees know how to use it? Why not? You wonder why? Because you get lazy. We like to order studies, right? And the radiologist, what are they going to say? Oh, please don't. I don't want to make any more money. Right? No. I got a kid in college, take it right now, it just cost me a fortune. Order whatever you want. Right? The other thing is, is that. We have these conceptions about what would be useful. When I went to Iraq, I thought, you know, we're going to do a ton of fast examinations. Nick. 
What we found when we talked this to the special forces operators is that trauma only comprises about 31% of what we do. Because when you're 10,000 feet on the mountain, you know how you tell a fracture? Almost down. Increased intracranial pressure, right? High altitude cerebral edema, almost down. So we found out that there are so many other uses for ultrasound, just like we were seeing in my town. The other thing is politics can hurt or help. Now, I, I know as medical students, you go, oh, I can't fight the political battles. Yes, you can. You know, Dave kind of stole my thunder, but when I came home from Iraq, I was like, this really needs to be taught on the battlefield. So I took a special forces medic with me and we went to meet the uh, head of radiology and I said, hey, I think we should be training these PAs and these special forces medics how to do blood ultrasound on the battlefield. Well, as short as I got thrown out of his office, and his parting words were, who are you going to train next, the books? So I'm walking back to my office, and I'm halfway there, and Monty says, that's a great idea. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, let's do a study. Let's train the books. Because I personally think it's not my heart. I bet we can train the book how to do the stuff. So we did a study, and we got physician assistants, special operations medics, conventional medics, and veterinary techs, and, and Food preparation specialists. They're not cooks, food preparation specialists. And I use that term for loosely. And you know who did the best? Who did the best? The cooks. Why? Because the doctors, the doctors are too smart. Listen. The PAs, yeah, I got that. I got that. But you know what the cooks do? They follow a recipe. They'll do exactly what you tell them. You know, ultrasound is not rocket science. That's why I can get up here and say I can do ultrasound. It's not hard. It's not easy. But if you're willing to put the time in, it's not that bad. And that leads me to my next point, which is, you guys say, well, I know Dave is telling me I should do ultrasound, but, but I'm just a medical student. I, I've got news for you. Training is more important than titles. I don't care if you're the cook. I care that you can do the scan. I don't care that you're a PA. I care that you can do the scan. Who did I teach second after myself and I met? My PAs, because if I got shot, I want someone to know what to do. And in your hospitals today, who's the most expensive? You are. So why not train someone who doesn't cost as much money how to do this life-saving skill? The other thing is, in hospitals, we change our practice based off what time of the day it is. Right? Who can get a pick line at 2 o'clock in the morning? Oh, no, 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 no. The pick team leaves at 4. Oh, that's right. Nobody needs a pick team at 2 a.m. Yes, they do. Why do we have calendars? So we can mark off 10 years in practice. Because we'll do the studies, and 10 years later, we'll actually start practicing them. That's why. Why do you have to wait 10 years to implement something that is known to be true? You know, Steve Jobs said that people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. And here's where the rubber meets the road. How many of you here today have seen somebody with shortness of breath? Anybody? It's pretty common, right? What do you do? How many of you here would order a chest x-ray on a patient with shortness of breath if you saw them? Raise your hand. Come on, let's act like it's American Idol. Everybody votes, right? It's not a flexion, it's an idol. So almost everybody in the room would order a chest x-ray. How many of you would order an ultrasound for your patient with shortness of breath? Okay. Why? Why do you not love the patients enough? <laughs> now you laugh, but what does the data show? The data is clear. If you ask a radiologist to interpret the chest x-ray for signs of congestive heart failure, they are right 69% of the time. Well, Rob, this is the Ohio State University. We have this test called BMP. We're not operating in BFE, right? We're operating in the hospital, dude. Okay, get your BMP. Specificity, 74%. Sensitivity, 90. Ultrasound? Yeah, it needs it. So why do you not order an ultrasound for your patient? It's better. It's cheaper. Time Magazine says radiation's evil, right? It's a new medical journal. Why are you radiating your patient? You say, well, I'm worried about pneumonia. There could be other things. Ultrasound's better for pneumonia, too. You say, well, that's for beads. Yeah, yeah, they're safe outside. <laughs> ultrasound's better for diagnosing pneumonia than your stinking x-ray machine. You say, well, Rob, I gotta know. Because they might be compensated, they might need innovated. What do you do when you innovate your patient? How many of you guys here use capnography after you innovate a patient to make sure you're in the right hole? Why do you do that? 
You got a bag in a freaking patient. What do you do when you bag the stomach? You increase the risk that they vomit, which increases the risk that they die, which increases the risk that you get sued. Why don't you watch it real time and see who's innovating? Because you can see the trade and you can see the esophagus real time. And when you innovate the goose, you get a double bubble. What's a double bubble mean? Anybody? Double bubble, double trouble. Because if you innovate the esophagus, it's kind of hard to ventilate the lungs. You can see in real time. This has been shown to be equivalent to capnography. And if you already own the machine, why do you like capnography? Well, they can code, right? If I innovate them in the goose, I guarantee it will die. What do you do in a code? How many of you guys pull an ultrasound for every single code? Do not love your patients. Because think about PDA. Ultrasound tells me, is this true PDA or is this pseudo PDA? The guy I saw the other day with half a fence post hanging out of his neck. They said he's dead, he has no lines. I took a look at his heart with ultrasound. That heart's one mile a minute. The problem is there's nothing in it. We filled up the chambers, took me to the OR, left the hospital. They're going to call the code, right? No signs of life. I respectfully submit, nothing says that you're alive like a beating heart. Also, respectfully submit, nothing says death like a non beating heart. How many of you guys have ever been to a pediatric code? They last for days because nobody wants to save their dad. You show mom and dad a non beating heart, 30 minutes later, show them a non beating heart, and they can stop. And they're right. And the other thing is, what else causes PDA? Pneumothorax. Oh, yeah, we can see that with ultrasound. Tampa on. You're never going to hear that. You can see with ultrasound. Hypovolemia, yeah, we can do that. PE, we can look for indirect signs, and I can see a couple of PEs all on all the time. Folks, I, I, I say these things, and I'm not going to stop and say that we have a lot more important things to do today. But, but I changed Steve Jobs' quote. The people who are crazy enough to think that they can change medicines are the ones who do. You see, the, really the question is are you crazy enough? But I'd also say that you don't have to be crazy. I hope you don't have to go to a foreign country and literally get shot after 365 days to change your practice. The fact of the matter is, is that you've been lied to, and they're lying to you on a daily basis. They tell you that your patients need a chest x-ray, quite frankly, you're wrong. Your patient needs an ultrasound. Are we not called to do what is better for our patient? Are we not called to look at the cost? Are we not called to save lives? That's what this does. I realize that radiologist doesn't make as much money. But I don't practice emergency medicine until the bank account. I practice emergency medicine to make a difference in my patients' lives. And the fact of the matter is, regardless of your title, regardless of what year you are as a medical student, you have an obligation to your patients to do what's best for their health. And I respectfully submit it many times. That's all for Thank you so much for your time. I'll take any questions you guys have. All right, thank you very much. Okay, well, we'll move quick. So, it seems like we can somehow scare Dharma, so that I was not fascinating too, which is because we don't have a lot of penetrating trauma. So, it's not like that about blood trauma. Well, you know, we do see blood trauma, and obviously, you can have a positive patch with blood. Um, but, you know, what we found was uh, serial pass is obviously very important. And if they have fluid, it helps me decide how fast to call the bird. But the other thing is, there's a lot of swelling. We saw a lot of blood chest problem. So for us, it's like, okay, your fast is negative, but you have a pneumothorax. Okay, you don't have a pneumothorax, but you have a pleural fusion. Okay, you don't have a dramatic pleural fusion, but do you have a rib fracture? Oh crap, we've got a rib fracture. Now, I don't have to evacuate you for that. In fact, I can actually block that and completely resolve your pain. But I can also follow you serially with ultrasound and tell you when your calcus is forming and it's ready to get on. The studies are not as good for reducing fractures, but that's what we use for that as well. Well, you've got a spirit one and all these kind of uses that make it a little bit uh, esoteric in church of the actually very practical. It's poor bodies. Poor bodies, fractures are incredible. You know, because, I mean, think about it. You know, when you see a fracture in your emergency department today or wherever your practice environment is, you know, oftentimes we're going to just put a cast on that, or if you're going to reduce it, you're going to do conscious sedation. But with nerve blocks, 
hematoma logs. Um, I've watched hands on 30 page needles. Some of you would never do an actual practice with that ultrasound because you're exposed to pull back and see the blood. But with ultrasound, you can take a 30 page needle right down to the fracture site, melt up the entire uh, finger or whatever you're using, do the reduction, look at the reduction, and then put them in the splint. And the difference is, is now I've got someone who's comfortable and properly managed. I can take longer time evacuating them so I don't have to put as many assets at risk in the middle of the night. We're securing a landing zone is, is a higher risk endeavor. Um, it puts more our medical crews at risk. Um, in Africa, when we practice, um, same thing. Um, it's really nice out here on the mud hut to kind of take a look at these kids and say, you know, I think we have a problem or I think we don't. But we definitely found that MSK is, is a much bigger issue. You know, somebody comes in and they sprain their ankle, it doesn't look too bad, but if you look at their ankle and they have a big fusion, again, a nice way to treat patients is going you uh, do an inarticular block. You give that patient a really long pain control and allows you to, in, in some cases, we reduce uh, you know, ankle fracture dislocations with absolutely no uh, chemical sedation whatsoever when the patient had a pain free experience. Which is good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, I just wonder if you have any practical advice for. I feel like when I go to hospitals on rotations and I see a situation where, hey, we could maybe do a point of care ultrasound on this, but the residents or attendings aren't familiar with that application of ultrasound. Um, do you have any advice on how to? What about changing their perception? Yeah. So you're saying that so you go to a place and maybe you know how to do all the time, but your residents and tenants don't know how to do it or not order. Right. So if there's like a like pediatric pneumonia situation. Yeah, so I don't see that changing tomorrow. This is that's some pretty good literature I've talked about. But I think it's coming, right? Because everybody's trying to lower radiation for teeth, et cetera. So there's a couple techniques, and I'll just start by saying I'm not the most politically correct guy in the world. <laughs> um, there's many ways you can do it, but nobody, the reason I think a lot of people don't do it is because nobody wants to look like a dog, right? Nobody likes to fiddle power around with a machine that they don't understand. So that's for a lot of the time, that's the hesitancy. And once you overcome that educational gap, then you're much more likely to get there with the individual you're with. And as a medical student, it is hard to impact that, right? Because I find the best way to make impact true lasting change is by building relationships. Because when you first come into a hospital and you meet a radiology group, they're not really interested in what you have to say. And you have to win the battle on patient safety. those unique cases, that's how you convert believers. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of online education. Because I'm here today and I'm teaching how many are here, what, 80, 120, whatever. I can reach you today, but on the web, I'll probably reach my opponent today. And I can show them the cases. And so I think that's the other thing, is you have to have the great cases. You show them the same, you show them how it changed somebody's care for the better. That's how you win them over. It's not going to happen overnight, though. And as a medical student, you are at disadvantage, right? Because you want honors or high pass. And you're probably not going to get it by telling them they're a dog. <laughs> but sometimes that's what's needed. I would recommend it towards the end of your rotation. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? All right. Hey, thanks again, guys. I appreciate your time.